So you want to be a pirate. Too bloody bad. That ship has sailed. The golden age of piracy is a thing of the past. So now you just have to contend yourself with movies and your imagination, which is free. Much like subscribing to this channel is also free. Cheap and free. <sighs> My name is Teresa and this is pirate fashion piracy. Why not? Pirates. I'm sure you're intimately acquainted with pirates. I don't know if you're like intimately acquainted with pirates because that's a weird thing to be. Chances are you've seen one or all the million pirates of the Caribbean movies out there. Today we're going to talk about the golden age of piracy and we're going to talk about the wardrobe essentials of a pirate and then a pirate captain and then perhaps a woman pirate. The golden age of piracy spanned between the 1650s to the 1730s. It was a time when piracy was a fruitful, profitable, side hustle for many. And for many, they took that side hustle and made it a, a full-time job. The first pirates were hired by their country, their monarchy, to plunder the goods of other countries. For instance, Sir Francis Drake was a privateer for Queen Elizabeth I. They plundered many a Spanish galleon for England and was celebrated for it. Muslim privateers hired by Barbary states and the Ottoman Empire were were constantly at war with European privateers, but both the groups were known as Cossairs, hired heavies from the government. Having worked a number of years plundering ships for their country and just getting a meager cut of it, they realized they could get richer if they just did it on their own, so they went into business for themselves. It's a natural progression, you know, you work someplace, get the hang of it, and then you go into business for yourself. It's aside from being a officer in the Navy and being hired as a privateer to plunder for your country, how else does one get into this lifestyle? A large percentage of the Navy was made of boys being pressed into service. They didn't have a choice. There were press gangs roaming around the docks of many seaside towns. And if they caught you unawares, they'll take you, put you on board, and then you were, you were put to work. I think they did pay you. You weren't a slave. You were just forced into a job. Can you imagine that happening nowadays? if these big corporations have run through their entire workforce. Everybody's either quit because the working conditions are not exactly ideal and they are in short of labor. So then they have press gangs go about town, pick up idle teenagers and force them into a life of minimum wage servitude. Like little Jimmy is picking up bread for his mother. He happens to live in Liverpool when the press gang comes in you there, you look unemployed. So that's exactly what happened during the golden age of piracy. That's how a lot of people kind of got involved in the nautical life. So when you're pressed into service, you're obviously not happy about it. I mean, you've been taken from your home to work on the high seas and working as a sailor is not an easy occupation. They probably don't know anything about swabbing a deck. Although if you lived back then, I would assume that you, you've swabbed something. You can't really get through life without manual labor. Obviously, the press gangs are not pressing the son of a duke into their service. They're not roaming around the rich part of town and picking up rich kids. They're scouting the poor side of town, cheap side, pressing poor kids poor teenagers. What are they going to do about it? They don't have any solicitors to combat these unfair labor practices. Once you are pressed into naval service, you're not happy about it. Who wants to work a job they didn't apply for? When you're on the ship, everybody had to pull their weight. Everybody had a job and everybody had to do it because if you didn't do your job, your fellow crew members will suffer for it. If you are manning top sails and you suck at what you do, then you can kill somebody. So it was very important that everybody pull their weight and they learned fast. And if you didn't learn fast, I don't know what they would do to you. Maybe they'll maroon you. They would definitely whip you. There was a lot of whipping on board the ship. It was very strict, very disciplined. You got ship shape or you shipped out. The captain's word was law. You didn't cross the captain. You didn't second guess him. You didn't give him any attitude. You didn't back sass him. He was basically like the warden in a prison and you didn't cross him unless you all get together and decide that he was unfit to lead 
in which case you'll have a mutiny on your hands. Let's just say for the sake of our scenario, while you may not love the captain, you grudgingly respected him, you did what you were told on this ship. That set the ground for the pirate's rule of conduct. When privateers, already seasoned with the experience of life at sea, decided to break off from their mother country and start their own business as pirates, plundering ships for their own profit. Just because the pirates are ungoverned by any one country's laws of the sea doesn't mean that they don't have a law onto themselves. This pirate code of conduct was followed by one and all on board the ship. They didn't break the rules. They were very strict about it. And breaking the rules was punishable by death. And there was a variety of punishments you can incur on the ship. You walk the plank, keel hauling, they tie you up, they drag you beneath the ship. Beneath the ship is covered with barnacles, so it like scrapes the skin off your body. And then they drag you up again and they do it over, rinse and repeat. Chance of drowning, but most likely chance of extreme exfoliation. While pirates have no allegiance to any one nation, they had an allegiance to their ship and their captain and their commanding officers, and they were not allowed to toy with women. All booty was to be equally shared. 30% of pirates during the golden age were of West African descent. Nine times out of 10, pirates of European descent were treated better, but things were a little bit more equal, probably because everybody needed to pull their weight. If you couldn't do the job, then you didn't need to be there. The Caribbean became the center of all the trade routes. In black sails, everybody was obsessed with Nassau. They were like, we've got to change Nassau. We got to, who owns Nassau? Nassau was the crowning jewel in this golden age of piracy. Everybody wanted to control it. It was like the Mecca for pirates. While I was watching Black Sails several years ago, I didn't even know that Nassau was a real place. I thought it was a fictional place in Black Sails derived from Treasure Islands. I thought it was part of Robert Louis Stevenson's imagination. And then I realized it was a real place. It's a destination for all those Royal Caribbean cruises. So it shows you how much I know. I don't know much about the Caribbean. Even though I got an A in geography many moons ago in high school, obviously that was in one ear and out the other. It was like monkey see, monkey do. Then there was Port Royal, another pirate hub during the golden age in Jamaica. And I did know that was a real place. I'm not that dumb. Speaking of black sails, that was a pirate show, wasn't it? I was in an abusive relationship with the show. I've never seen pirates be so depressed. You always think, that pirates are jolly people. They're probably not. These pirates were depressing people. They had weighty issues on their mind. And all this time I thought all pirates are supposed to be like Jack Sparrow, very swashbuckling, very debonair, have a lust for life. But these pirates were the most depressing people I've ever seen. And every season, oh, they would talk so much. And every season I would say, this is it. I'm breaking up with this show. But then they would end it on this exciting cliffhanger. And I thought I was out, they draw me back in. So when I was 10, I wanted to be a fearless lady captain, just like Gina Davis in Cutthroat Island, the movie that I keep mentioning, but nobody has seen. So there's no judgment on my part. In fact, I'm going to help you facilitate your transformation from this to pirate, to Captain Jack Sparrow, or Captain Hook, or Captain Kidd, or Captain Morgan, or Anne Bonny, whatever you want. We're going shopping for pirate gear, but not physically because I'm not taking you anywhere, I'm taking you on a trip through time to the golden age of piracy. I'm excited. Tell me you're excited. Are you excited? Maybe you're not that excited, but you will be. I'm going to massage your cells with knowledge. So you want to dress like a pirate. Boy, did the world do a number on you. How do you become a pirate? What do you wear? Where do you get your clothes? Well, most pirates got their clothes by stealing. Good old fashioned theft, they raid a merchant ship. They stole bolts of silk, calico. They love themselves some, some calico. Lots of plundered textiles. They love to plunder a good bolt of textiles. Did they make their clothes themselves? I think they did. I think they made their clothes themselves. You are on a sailing vessel who would definitely know how to A, tie a serious knot, B, patch up your torn sails so you would have have like one of those serious needles, not your grandma's needles, not like your free sewing kit needles. 
but like a serious hook needle. And if you can patch up canvas, you can sew a jacket or some, some pants. You know what I mean? From your plundered textiles. And they love bright colors. They love a nice fun time print. The sumptuary laws of the mid 1600s, early 1700s dictates that only fancy people, aristocratic people, rich people can wear fancy clothes with fancy fabric. But if you stole it from the rich, you're gonna wear it yourself. It's basically like plundering a cargo ship full of Gucci. You'll wear that Gucci, but you have to like make it yourself because you're very crafty. You're a crafty pirate. You could have your own DIY TikTok set to the tunes of a viral sea shanty. Headscarf, tri-corner hat. You have your baldric, which is like your leather belt that you wear as a sling, like a crossbody, and you use that to hold your pistols and your dueling swords so you don't lose them during a nautical raid. Think that they have gold teeth, earrings, a parrot, a wooden peg. They have everything. They love the rings just like Jack Sparrow, all the necklaces. That is the common misconception we have. And while they are indeed not afraid to accessorize, they are first and foremost sailors. They have to dress practically for the sea. Of course, the pirate captain, he could dress a little fancier. The fancier you dress, the more you portray how successful you are at pirating, how much you stole. It's a pirate flex when you land in Port Royal or Nassau, how successful, how great of a pirate you are. It's also a form of recruitment because if you're strutting past some would-be pirates, they see how well-dressed you are and they have aspirations to be like you. He's like a peacock signaling other wannabe peacocks to a ship so that they can pirate together. You're everyday pirates. You're not a captain. You're just a member of the crew. What would you wear on your magnificent pirate body? Ordinary seamen wore short cropped jackets. They're useful for keeping warm, but they don't have any tails to impede your agility in case you get caught up in the rigging. These jackets were very basic. They're made of heavy blue or gray cloth known as fear knots. The cloth was either made of wool or hard wearing fustane, but if you were an officer of a higher rank, a quartermaster or boatswain, then you had a longer jacket that ended mid thigh. And if you were the captain, you had the longest jacket of all. Rank determined by jacket length, props for your normal everyday sailor, mid thigh. Buttons for these coats were made of brass, bone, tin, or discs covered in fabric. And in heavier weather, a sailor may prefer a longer coat made of canvas and it's utilized for everything. Very resourceful material. You're used to repairing tears in canvas with your hook. It's not just the needle, it's, it's like a hook needle. In Outlander season three, when Claire was pressed into surgeon service on board the porpoise, all the crew on board were dying of like diphtheria or something. One of her patients that she was tending kicked the bucket. She had to sew him up in a bolt of canvas. The needle went through his nose or mouth. You gotta make sure that he's dead. What do they wear underneath their jackets? A collarless linen shirt. You don't need no collar unless you're the captain. A scarf to mop up the sweat and protect you against the sun. You can also use a scarf for a variety of ways, like, like a bandana, protecting you against the harsh Caribbean sun. And they would also wear a waistcoat in either a solid color stripe or checkered. Why do they wear stripes? Because if you fell overboard, you were easier to spot. However, if you wore just like a solid blue color, that would be kind of dumb. You'd be camouflaged with the sea, which will be your new home after you drown because nobody could spot you. They won't shout man overboard because they can't see you. So stripes saves lives. What I find very interesting is that a lot of sailors, a lot of pirates didn't even know how to swim. They wore baggy trousers came in two kind of designs. One, a bell-bottom-esque design, and the other, a short billowy design called the petticoat breech. Kind of like the culottes, like a wide-legged ankle pant. Baggy trousers were a necessity because you could roll them up to your knees so you don't get them wet while you're swabbing the deck. They give you ease of movement as you're swinging across the rigging or climbing up the mast. Famous female pirates of the time, Anne Bonnie and Mary Reed, they were both 
both drawn or etched in those broad size. Baggy trousers and shirts typical of the male mariners. They're always drawn with a plunging neckline to show some major cleavage, which I believe is entirely false because if you are impersonating men to be a pirate, the last thing you would want to show is your cleavage. You don't want to get a sunburned um, chest. The thing with life at sea, you don't want anything flopping out. I really think the real life Anne Bonny, as dashing and rakish as she looks in these illustrations, she would not be so scantily clad. She would basically look as much like a man as possible. And boobs, it defeats the purpose of the cross dress. You don't want to incite any feelings of lust from your shipmates. They've been months at sea. They haven't seen a woman in a while. You don't want to. You don't want to. You don't want to get in with them because a lot of pirates had scurvy, the disease of the gums, the bleeding gums, the falling out teeth when you don't have enough vitamin C in your diet. So a lot of the times the ship's cook would spice the rum with limes or other citrus that they pick up at port. But most of the time when you're eating hard tack and gruel, the same moldy stew that you've had for weeks, your teeth are gonna fall out. Those poor historical people, they were so dirty. Jackets were the most prized possession of a captain. It distinguished you from your officers. Tis the power of clothing to signify one's rank. The pirate captain would wear a long coat, typically one borrowed from a plundered vessel or just bought ashore. They could buy it because the captain's salary was twice that of his men. In the fashion of the time of the 1600s, the Baroque period, the early 1700s, is a long coat with an extraordinarily large amount of buttons. Buttons down the entire front length and wide cuffs at the back. Think the Captain Hook coat. Bartholomew Roberts, also known as Black Bart Roberts, was famous for wearing his long scarlet coat. His enemy, the French, would call him the Pretty Red. And he was one of the most successful pirates in the golden age of piracy. He would wear his scarlet Captain Hook coat with a diamond encrusted cross necklace. He was 100% iced out. To flex your success as a pirate, adornment was everything. If you can ice out your pistols, your swords, feathers in your hat, lots of rings, lots of plundered gold, you would do so as the pirate captain. The reason why in real life pirate captains would not wear a tricorn hat, although it was very popular at the time for landlubbers, is that they're really not practical at sea. The front part obscured your view when you're trying to like duck under the rigging and the hat with three wide points made it very easy for it to blow off your head during a heavy gale. Blackbeard Edward Teach, which is his real name, wore a feathered hat, which he would light fuses under when he went into battle. Pirate captains also sought to wear wigs that were very popular amongst aristocratic gentlemen of the 17th and 18th century. Because wigs were expensive to make, the longer the wig, the more successful, the richer you are. That's where you get the term the big wig. The more gentleman pirates may decorate their black or white wigs with ribbons, but Blackbeard did not wear a wig, but he did tie ribbons in his great black beard. As for the regular crew member, tight fitting caps made of wool or leather. During a heavy rain, a canvas cap would replace a wool or leather waterproofed by tarring. Tarring was a great way to waterproof one's clothes. In the sailing world, earrings were not commonly worn. I mean, they were not very practical. It could get caught on something. In the sailing world, it was also considered effeminate. Only Elizabethan male courtiers wore earrings, you know, the dangly pearl earrings, but not necessarily their maritime counterparts. Definitely a use for eye patches. There's a lot of accidents. You get struck in the eye with rope or tackle, probably stared at the sun at some point. If you lived past a certain age, if you didn't expire at sea as a pirate and you lived to the ripe old age of like 50 or so, most likely you're toothless, you're blind, you've got scars, you have no eye. If you need a parrot as your like sight dog, maybe you'll be missing a limb. A lot of scars on your face, scars from, from skin cancer. You didn't have sunscreen back then. Calico Jack 
who's known for his sartorial flair. Even if he looked like Chris Hemsworth himself, after 10 years at sea, he would look like a California raisin with no teeth and no eyes, missing a leg. Scars were considered cool on a pirate ship. They wouldn't mask their scars. They would display it proudly. Like you want a nice like slash through your eyebrow. Pirates definitely dressed up when they went ashore. I mean, why wouldn't you? You wanna look your best for the wenches, maybe other pirates that are trying to court you. You wanna, you know, like jump ship, seek better opportunities with a more badass pirate captain. So they wore their Sunday vests, their regular clothes, and all their plundered textiles that they crafted aboard, their jewels that they also plundered, and perhaps an eye patch, perhaps not. Definitely their crossbody belt, their utility belt. When pirates are captured and facing execution, they would wear their vests. You wanna look good before you are hung. There are records of pirates busting out velvet coats, taffeta breeches, brightly colored silks, ribboned stockings for their last right on earth. If I had to name my favorite pirate movie, Cut Throat Island, starring Gina Davis and Matthew Modine, a big expensive wannabe blockbuster that bankrupted a studio, a treasure hunt, there was a villain, it was her uncle. He was called the Black Dog or something. Every pirate has a cool nickname. So she was a female pirate, she was badass, she was really tall, she was a sword fighter. There was like a high speed carriage chase in Port Royal. They wrecked the city. They Michael Bayed the entire city. She blew up the town, ship cannonball fight, pirates boarding other ships. Oh, a pirate's life is a life for me. Never, ever, 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 